but uh, I like being down uh, on the lower level, to be honest. Um, the, the chairs are here because Timothy was doing some special graduation. Uh, as Glenn said, don't get used to them. Um, I did like them. I suggested maybe we should set them up in just like the first three rows, and then suddenly people might decide the front row wasn't such a bad idea, although empty, empty, like... <laughs> If your back hurts after the service, it's your fault. There were nice seats available to you. Well, you may remember, may, many of you may remember, those of you who are maybe closer to my age may remember the, the pot-bellied pig craze that swept the nation, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, when uh, people were buying these uh, pigs from Vietnam as pets. Well, it started when breeders claimed two things about these pigs. First of all, that they were very smart, and secondly, that they would not grow to be more than 40 pounds. So people, for some reason, thought, wouldn't it be great just to have a pig in the house? <laughs> I know it was the 80s. What were people thinking? And maybe the 90s even, still a little bit crazy. But the problem was this. Breeders, the breeders were only half right. They, they were very smart. Some of them learned to walk with a leash. Others were litter box trained. But they would actually grow to be 150 pounds or more. Another drawback was that they often became openly aggressive, not very pet-like. So what would people do with an unwanted pot-bellied pig? <laughs> Bacon, I know, I know, no, but no, 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 no. Well, fortunately, fortunately there, according to an article in the U.S. News and World Report, a man named Dale Riffle came to the rescue. Someone had given Dale one of these pigs, and he absolutely loved it. Enough so that he ended up selling his home in the suburbs and moving to a farm with of five acres in West Virginia. I mean, it's shocking that a guy like that would move to West Virginia. Who would have thought? Well, he really enjoyed his pet, but Rufus was not exactly a good pig. He was not litter box trained. Not only that, but he loved to eat carpet, wallpaper, and drywall. Mmm, nothing tastes like drywall. Boy, this the uh, well, again, this guy loved this pig, though, and he actually started taking in other pot belly pigs into his home. I've included a picture of Dale with Rufus, and it's a touching <laughs> picture of a man and his cute little pig. Again, really? Someone wants that as a pet? Well, when the article was written, Dale had 180 pig residents on his farm. And these pigs didn't just live there, he gave them a luxurious lifestyle. The article states that the little porkers would snooze on beds of fresh pine shavings every night. He had little plastic pools they could bathe in, and he piped in classical music. Because everyone knows pigs love Mozart, I guess. I, I don't know. Well, they would also wait in line for the belly rubs that he would give to them. He says that he, he would socialize them in age-graded pig affinity groups. Really? Hey. Pig affinity groups. I, again, don't know what that means. Well, these pigs never had the fear, though, that one day they would become bacon or pork chops because Dale was a safe place. Believe it or not, there actually was a waiting list of pigs waiting to be adopted into Dale's farm. He says this, We were all put on earth here for some reason, and I guess pigs are my lot in life. <laughs> By the way, I think he's single. <laughs> Go figure, I have no idea why. <laughs> now, I'm sure you would agree, it's absolutely amazing that a guy, first of all, you'd want the pot belly pig. Okay, but if you think they're going to be little and cute, I could kind of see it, but then it grows to be this monstrous thing, so you leave your home, move to a new area, in order to bring 180 pigs onto your farm. That is absolutely crazy to love pigs. But I can tell you something even more amazing. That the God of this universe perfect and holy without flaw, who is worshipped day and night by angelic beings, would choose to love human beings who are broken, who are sinful, who so often reject him and mock him, and yet still God would choose to love us. That is even more amazing. And then this God who loved us told us this, because I have loved you, so you are to love one another. So, why does the Bible make such a big deal out of Christians loving each other? 27 times the Bible commands Christians to love one another. Why doesn't God just tell us to, to put up with each other? Tolerate one another. Why is loving each other such a significant part of our spiritual journey? 
Well, this morning it's time to get real. It's time to set aside our excuses as to why it's so difficult to love one another. And take a hard look at why God places this in such a high level of importance. If Dale can love pigs, why do we find it so hard to love each other? We're going to be looking at 1 John chapters 3 and 4, because the fourth value of our church, our, our core value, our heartbeat as we call it, says this, Christ calls us to be a loving community, and this happens best in small groups. So let's look at what 1 John has to say about loving one another. Chapter 3, verse 11 of 1 John says this, not John, 1 John, back near the end of your Bible. It says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. So John is not telling them something new. He's not saying, wow, I have this, this totally crazy idea that I want to share with you for the first time. He's saying, listen, you've heard this all along. Love one another. Most people equate love with affectionate feelings. That's why there can be people who are married for years, and yet they say they've fallen out of love. The feelings pass, and therefore the commitment is gone as well. Biblical love is not a love of just feelings. It's a love where it's a decision that is made. It's not about affection. Real love begins with your will, and then it moves to your emotions. And that way we can love even people that aren't even necessarily easy to like. Because God has placed it in us. Because loving one another is such a true mark of Christianity. The enemy expends a great deal of time trying to divide us. Trying to destroy marriages and friendships and churches. Because he knows how important this is. Well, chapter 3, verse 16. John then continues. This is how we know that what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but, does, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. Now the word translated as laid down in verse 16, talking about Jesus laying down his life, is a word that was used for a garment being laid aside. The idea is he willingly set aside his life for us. And this act of love wasn't just a good example. It was for us, it says here. Or literally, it was on our behalf. This act of love was done to bring the love of God into our lives. To rescue us from our sin. And from our eternity of separation from God. What does true love look like? Does really loving someone mean that you are a doormat and they can walk all over you? Does it mean that you're never able to disagree? Well, John does not use philosophical arguments or ideals of what love is. He doesn't give us any abstract definitions. John directs our attention to Jesus and what he did for us. You want to know what real love looks like? Look at what Jesus did. Don't look it up in the dictionary. Look at the Lord. He died for our sins. That's love. He sacrificed everything for us. That is love. John goes from the plural in verse 16 of brothers and sisters. To then talking about the singular, his brother, in verse 17. Someone said, loving everybody in a general way is a good excuse for loving nobody in a particular way. In other words, oh, we say we love everyone, but we don't actually ever show love to anyone. Well, John says that we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but in specific and very tangible ways. The New International Version of the Bible has translated the phrase in verse 17 as no pity, and it's actually a fairly puny way to translate this phrase. It could literally have been translated from the Greek as to shut up or to lock up one's heart. So the idea is you've locked up your heart to the needs of others. And you're not helping and serving. You've closed them off. When any follower of Jesus has enough and sees someone in need and yet shuts their heart to them, they're not showing the love of God. John gets very practical, practical then laying out for us what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. He says, if we have material possessions, all of us have to some extent, and we see a Christian with legitimate needs, and we close our heart to that person, then it's as if we're extinguishing God's love in our life. Love is expressed not so much in the heroic sacrifice of our life, but in the ordinary circumstances of every day where God shows us a need, and we are able to meet it with his love. If Dale can lovingly take care of 180 pot belly pigs, why do we find it so hard to love one another? Tim Peck says, our problem is that we often avoid seeing our brother or sister in need. We insulate ourselves from the needs. If we could grow in any way in this area, it would be to pay more attention to each other. 
to know each other well enough to know when someone is struggling and we have the ability to meet that need. Now, I've got to be honest, in a church of our size on Sunday morning, it's really difficult to do this. There's just too many people to talk to. And that's why we really focus on our small groups, what we call care groups. Because the care groups are a great place where you can grow to know others. Matter of fact, in that core value, Christ calls us to be a loving community, this happens best in small groups. Because it's there you can get to really know one another. I remember when Pastor Bob was diagnosed with cancer, and as he became more and more ill and they needed more and more help, his care group stepped in in such an amazing way. Yeah, the church helped, so many of you helped, but it was his care group, the people that he had been investing in and really getting to know well, that were especially there for Bob and Cheryl. And after Bob had passed away, I remember the first big snowstorm we had, uh, you know, months after his death, and I remember calling someone because I was concerned about Cheryl and how was she going to get out. And one of the members of her care group then called me and said, oh, Mark, don't worry about it. We're already planning to shovel her out. We've already talked about it as a group. That's the kind of stuff that happens when we truly get to know and love one another. Christ calls us to be a loving community. This happens best in small groups. Why? Because we can truly know the needs and express that love to one another. If you're, in a, if you're not in a care group, I would encourage you, get involved in one. Now, most of them are winding down. I know the men's group is meeting this week and then a couple more weeks, and then it'll take a summer break. Most of the groups take a summer break. In September, we're going to start a new series called Not a Fan. And it talks about, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower? Because Jesus is not looking for fans to go rah, 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 go Jesus. He's looking for followers who will really live his way. So there's going to be a video series that small groups will be watching. And we're going to be starting a bunch of new small groups, and I would challenge you, if you're not in a group, get involved and begin to pray for us now as we work on kicking that off. I really believe it's true this heartbeat that loving one another happens best in smaller groups. Sunday school, you get to know people. I know in Glenn's group, in Deb's class, they get to know one another. Look for those opportunities. Well, now let's jump ahead to chapter 4, beginning with verse 7 as John continues this idea of loving one another. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Now, verse 7 here does not mean that the way people become Christians is by loving others. There are some who have taken this just that, oh, you love people? Oh, then, you, then, then truly, you must be born again. No, the Bible is clear. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ. But if you have real faith in Jesus Christ, then it should show if you say, oh, I know Jesus, I love him so much, and you love nobody else, and you are selfish and self-centered and mean-hearted, then there's a problem. There's a heart problem. You might be having a heart attack. God wants to change that. If you truly know the Savior, you should be loving towards others. It should be increasing in your life, that love for those around you. Now, our natural question is this. How do we know God really loves us? And John answers that. By saying, look at what God did. He sent His Son into this world. The word showed in verse 9 means to take something that can't be seen and to make it visible. God made His love visible. He made it concrete by showing that He loved us enough to send Jesus to rescue us from hell. And this leads John to a definition of love in verse 10. Now lots of people have tried to define love. Love is a many splendored thing. Does anyone know what that means? I don't. I mean, there's other sayings, like, it's like a rose, it's fragrant and beautiful, but it's also thorny and painful. Or love means never having to say you're sorry. Really? So because I love you, I never have to apologize to you when I do something mean? Is that love? Well, no. Again, he shows us. John is, has nothing to do with abstract definitions, no pie-in-the-sky sentimentality. Instead, he points to the cross, where we learn what love is like. Not by starting with our human experience of love and working from there, but simply looking at what God has done by showing us love through Jesus Christ. 
Our Lord gave his life because he loved us. And this leads John to prod us to love one another. Because the cross should empower us to love. Matter of fact, in verse 12, John says that God's love is made complete in us when we love one another. The word made complete literally means to be fully accomplished. Or to successfully accomplish a mission. In other words, God's mission was made complete in us when we love one another. That word, God's desire is that we truly care. Throughout this passage, John's been using the Greek word for love, which is agape. Now, although in English we have one word for love, the Greek is actually much better. They had multiple words for love that differentiated. There was eros love, erotic love, that romantic love. There was the love that friends would have for one another. Love that family naturally has. Each of these were a different Greek word. But this agape love was a love that was sacrificial, that was giving and expected nothing in return. It's the love that God has for his people. A love that he has shown to us. That then God expects us to share with others. So he's, he's been talking about love. He's not saying love each other like the friendly love, like, hey, buddy, I love you, man. No, it's a deeper love that sacrifices no matter what. It's a love that loves even when it's not returned. It's a love that wants the best for the other person. Perhaps this godlike love is best described in the very famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This agape love is not a romantic love that you fall into and then you fall out of. It's a decision of the will to love and care for others. And it's not short-lived. You know, often romantic love comes and it goes. No, this kind of love is a love that stays on forever. Verse 16, John continues. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now it says here, God is love. Love is a part of his very nature. It is part of who he is. Elsewhere in John, 1 John, he talks about the fact that God is light. Who God is love is just part of who he is. That's an attribute that is always his. And John tells us that because we've experienced this love, we don't have to fear God's wrath. We don't have to be afraid. Some of you, you grew up in churches where they taught you just to fear God. And the Bible talks about it in a way you honor him, in a way where you, you place him above yourself. But if you spend your life fearful of God, then you don't know him very well. Because the Bible's clear, when Jesus Christ gave his life, anyone who would receive him becomes a child of God. And God is not some angry parent who loves to just absolutely discipline, and, and he's not an abusive father, he's a loving father. Like any loving father, yes, he will sometimes discipline his children. I discipline my kids not because it's fun. I don't go like, man, I really hope they do something in school today. Come on. Man, I really hope they disobey me. I, I, I gave him this job. He doesn't do it. Oh, I can't wait to think of how I'm going to get it. No, I don't do that. When they don't do something I've told them to do, I'm like, oh, I don't want to discipline them. God's desire is not to discipline his children. He wants them to walk with him because he loves them. Perfect love casts out all fear. Well, then verse 19, it says this, We love because he first loved us. And this is a point that is vital. You see, if you try to love out of your own power, if you decide, you know, I'm going to be a loving person, I'm going to try to be much better about this, you are going to fail. Because none of us have the level of love that God wants us to share. But the great news is this, God has that love already. It says that we love because he first loved us. And this is the key. David Hope writes, do you need more love? Then draw from the wells of God's love. The Holy Spirit has a river of love that he wants to pour into us and then let flow through us. We're much like the faucet on our sink. The faucet's not the source of the water. It merely releases the water. 
See, there's no magic faucets that you don't have to hook up to a line. You know, you just stick a faucet there and it suddenly works. The faucet doesn't do anything. It's the water pressure through the pipes that you're just opening up and then it flows through. And that's the idea. Because it's, you're, you're not the water. You don't need to create the love in you. You need to allow the Spirit of God to change your heart. So the love flows through you. And then like a fa faucet, you just let it out. You're looking for opportunities to release that love onto others. Verse 20 then. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. What John is saying is that true love is not manifested just with words. It must be shown by our deeds. And then he gives us the illustration of someone who claims to love God and yet has no love for the people that God has placed around them. He tells us this person is nothing but a liar. The evidence of God's love in us is the love then flowing through us. God has given us his love, not simply so we can enjoy it and bask in it, but so that we can share it. We must start with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, many of us want to love others, but we don't know where to begin. Well, there are some practical ways you can demonstrate your love. First of all, we need to accept one another. We need to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. When we came to know Jesus, we were freely accepted. And we must cultivate that attitude of acceptance for one another. Our church is named Grace. That's the first word in our name. And that is the thing I want our church so desperately to be about, is to be a place of grace. You know what? None of you here today, you're not perfect. None of you are the perfect parishioner. You're not the perfect husband, the perfect wife, the perfect friend. Nobody here is. And so we need to learn to accept each other. All of us have our flaws. All of us have our quirks. And yet God still calls us to love one another. What else do we need to do? We need to encourage one another. The scriptures talk about letting our words be seasoned with grace. We should be speaking words of encouragement. You know what? People who are encouraging... Others want to be around them. When encouragement flows out of your lip, you're just going to find people are going to naturally gravitate towards you. I mentioned it before, Jeff Crum has the gift of encouragement like few people I've ever known. And he's just fun to be around. Because Jeff likes to encourage people. And you know what? You were born in New Jersey, right? <laughs> born and raised in New Jersey, he works in New York City, and this guy's got a heart that is so soft and tender and caring, okay? It's possible. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible. I know sarcasm is what New Jersey's good at, and I, I'm, I'm good at it too, and, and I like sarcasm. It's fun for a little bit, but we need to look at how can we encourage others? How can we lift others up and make them feel loved? The third thing we can do, and we need to do, is be honest with one another. To say that Jesus loves people is not to say he'll do for them whatever they want him to do. Don Al Dan Allender writes, if Christ had practiced the kind of love we advocate nowadays, he would have lived to a ripe old age. In other words, nowadays, don't offend any, don't, don't say something that might make hurt someone's feelings. You know what, friends? If Jesus had done that, when the Pharisees said, what, you claim to be the Son of God? Whoa, I can see that upsets you. Listen, if that, that upsets you, I'm, no, I'm not the Son of God. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm a really good teacher? Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, I'm a really good teacher. No, Jesus spoke the truth. Matter of fact, the Pharisees, he said, you hypocrites. He was not always easy. He spoke the truth. And friends, we need to do the same thing. Now, the problem is some of you here, you like to speak the truth. And you forget about what the Bible says, speak the truth in love. And you're just like, I love to speak the truth. And if it's not in love, then it's not what God wants. So always before we speak words that are going to be hard for someone to hear, we need to be saying, Lord, is this what you want me to say? How do you want me to say it? What's the way I can do it? Jesus in the books of Revelation, as he's writing these churches, if you remember, if you speak of churches, what he has to say to the church is often it's tough stuff. It's not, I love you, you're the best ever. What he says is, I love you, but. And that's what we need to do. We speak the truth in love. I love you, I'm so thankful for you, but there's something I see and I need to share that with you. So be honest with one another. 
Romans 14 encourages us to admonish one another in love. And isn't it great to have people in your life who will love you enough to speak the truth to you? And then the final thing is this, act lovingly toward one another. Again, John said, don't just love with words, love with deed. We need to do love. God leads into our path every day those who are in need. He's placed them there for a reason. And he wants us to respond with the love of Christ. You know, loving someone may mean giving an hour of your time to that person who has nobody and they're hurting and they're longing for someone to listen. It may mean giving a ride to a doctor for someone who doesn't have a family around to help them. It may mean helping out financially someone who's watched the bottom drop out of their life. The list of opportunities to love is endless. But what we have to do is this. Say to the Lord, God, what is it you have for me to do? We can't meet every need. There's no way we can touch every single life that needs to be touched. But we need to say, Lord, what is it you've called me to do? Who have you brought into my path today that you want me to help? And then we need to respond. Do what he says. You know, it's time to stop talking about loving one another and start actually doing it. Your Heavenly Father has given you a job to do, and it's time to do it. The Lord is not looking for bench warmers, like this fictional NFL star, Leo. Leo! Hey, what's up? It's a quick hop at you, guys. I don't know about that, Coach. I think I can do more for this team. I ain't on the sideline. Hey, man, this game's a lost cause. Lost cause. Hey, I got this great scene over here on the bench, and I figured I could sit on down at the camera for the same on me. See the pain and anguish all over my face. Watching great athletes suffer is very powerful emotional stuff. Coach, sit down. I'm going to down, Coach. <laughs> I love when Leon says, it's a lost cause anyway, Coach. And then we still Coach says, go sit down, Leon. He says, I won't let you down, Coach. <laughs> well... Friends, it's time to get off the bench. Your Heavenly Father has given you a job. And too often, like Leon, we're going, Lord, I'm pretty good back here. And Leon said, I got a nice spot on that bench. And some of us, we've got a nice spot on our bench. We're really happy doing nothing. But friends, that's not what God has for us. He wants you to be used by Him. He wants to fill you up with His endless love and then have you share it with those around you. So to close, I want to ask you this. How are you doing at loving others? Do you accept others as they are, or do you judge every person that you meet? Do you encourage others with your words, or do you leave in your wake people who are hurting? Do you speak the truth in love? Do you show your love through your actions? If not, then I would challenge you. Today is the day to start. Let's pray. Lord, your word has commanded.